Hello, everybody. Please, everybody just stand up once and down. Just speak, wake yourself up. It's nap time. <laughs> Yay. Coach Blade has made you moves. Yeah, do a couple of jumping jacks. Okay, now you can sit down and now see, now you don't have to give me a standing ovation. It's all in. <laughs> all right, so, um, so I think I've got this all set up here. So I'm gonna talk about when women's sports meet gender ideology, seven stages of grief. Having dealt with the conflict between gender identity and sports for over five years now, I can look back and see that the journey bears remarkable similarities to the process of grieving. Losing a loved one, a job, or something extremely important in one's life typically involves um, an emotional, emotional sequence that descends into a valley of deep despair that eventually levels off and begins to ascend into acceptance and hope with a better understanding on how to proceed with life. When I sat myself down to think about what to say today, I realized that my personal journey over the past half decade has run remarkable, a mar remarkably parallel course. Sport has been my life, a permanent part of my identity. Sport is mainly responsible for all the beautiful things that I enjoy right now. As an NC2A athlete, it gave me my university education. Thank you, Title IX. As a scientist, coach, and program developer, it gave me a career. As a leader of a sports association in Canada, it gave me insight. So stage one is shock. It was in this leadership capacity. I was president of Athletics Alberta in the province of Alberta the Track and Field Association that I attended a national meeting at our Canadian national governing body in 2018. We were shown a new policy that we were being asked to support, one that would allow any boy or man to instantly self-identify as a female athlete. No surgery, no hormonal mitigation. He could compete as a woman one day and as a man the next, flipping back and forth as he pleased. It was shocking. The bigger shock was that it was the governing body, the, the sort of standalone agency, government-funded, anti-doping, anti-cheating agency that was actually pushing this policy, the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport, CCES. Their document justifying it was the craziest science-denying opus one could ever imagine. It was full of gems like this. While acknowledging the competitive advantage that men have over women in sports, it asserted, nevertheless, that trans women are people who have always been psychologically female, but whose anatomy and physiology, for reasons yet unexplained, have manifested as male. <laughs> Stage two, anguish. Still at that meeting, I looked at my fellow presidents, and they were all sitting around the table uh, in disbelief. I said, you are joking, right? We already know from all of the records in track and field that males have a massive competitive advantage. This just cannot be right. And instead of looking at me in the eye and giving me any reasons, they looked down at their hands and made no eye contact. And I knew in that moment, in that meeting room, something was up. My immediate thought was, there must be a higher authority I can turn to. I went home and looked up the IOC policy, and I was absolutely blown away. I hadn't been paying attention, obviously. I read with a growing knot in my stomach how the IOC had, first of all, stopped sex verification screening way back in the 1990s, had allowed male transsexuals into women's sports category in 2003, and by 2015 had done away with the surgical requirement altogether. Men were being allowed to compete as long as they kept their T levels down below some arbitrary concentration that was still up to four times to 10 times higher than the upper testosterone limit for female competitors. And for me, the real killer was that the one governing body who was also getting government funding, whose entire mandate was to advocate for women and girls in sport, Canadian women and girls in sport, had totally conceded the field. Here was a CC, here was a Canadian women's sport, not at all awkward, quote, we believe that inclusion of women and girls must include inclusion of trans women and girls. 
The word anguish hardly covers it. I mean, I, I just reeled. My mind reeled. What is going on? I was bewildered. I looked, I took the president of my national governing body, Athletics Canada, to a dinner, and I just put the question at him. I said, Bill, what is up? What's going on here? And he kind of hesitated and smirked and hummed and hawed, and I said, oh, oh, I see what you're doing here. You're worried that the transactivists will sue you. And he said, he, did, he, he didn't say anything. I said, but there are many, many more. Can't you see? There's many more women and girls. Surely you, you know some of them might sue you. And he said to me, and I quote, girls wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, that comment turned me into an activist. <laughs> so stage three was anger. 2018 to 2019, once I became aware, I began to see it happening everywhere. And I'm going to ask to play the video right away. This is Terry Miller, one of the Connecticut uh, high school athletes, winning by such a large margin over Chelsea Mitchell and the other girls. If we can play that. Kyle Gabinelli. <sighs> Horrible running technique as a coach. Oh my God, that. It doesn't matter though. It's a boy. I mean, it's overwhelming. It doesn't matter that his hand is going way out here like this. He's not running well, but he's winning. Wait, okay, I'll go to the next one. Okay. And it was even worse seeing what was happening in contact sport. Here was hapless Tamika Brent getting into the MMA ring with an opponent whom she thought was a female, only to have the other fighter, Fallon Fox, turn out to be male. The result, a, pro a broken eye socket, cracked skull, seven staples in her head. But it was the attitude that was equally outrageous. Reaching out on social media, reacting, excuse me, to a social media post to someone making a comment about how women need single-sex spaces for safety, Fallon Fox bragged, quote, for the record, I knocked out two. One woman's skull was fractured, the other not. And just so you know, I enjoyed it. See, I love smacking up tefs in the cage who talk transphobic nonsense. It's bliss. Don't be mad. And then he ended with a wink and a kiss emoji. And of course, there was male cyclist Rachel McKinnon expressing the hope on a tweet that those who oppose men and women's sports will, quote, die in a grease fire, unquote. But why should be, we be angry, right? <laughs> and then we got to stage four dismay, 2019 to 2020. I label this stage dismay, even though in the true grieving process, it would be labeled depression. It was the lowest point along the absurd journey. Yet, even while it was horrible, I could already see the green shoots of our ability to fight back. When reasoning with leadership colleagues behind closed doors failed to move the needle, I decided to speak out openly on social media. Very soon, I found common cause. Groups like Fair Play for Women in the UK sent me DMs to encourage me. Megan Murphy was the first to interview me on her podcast, Feminist Current. Yet even in that year, do you remember this year? That was the year Twitter shut down accounts and censored prominent people like Megan and Posey Parker and anybody else who could be acu accused, even retroactively, of being in violation of their new terms of service, disallowing things like dead naming and misgendering. These were concocted terms most of us had never heard of. Right around that time, right around the same time Megan Murphy was punted from Twitter, I made my way to Washington, D.C. for the rally in support of women's sports. The Supreme Court was having their hearings on the Bostock case, which had implications for anyone in society being able to recognize biological sex as a distinct characteristic in law. I'll say more about the Bostock in the next slide. There is nothing like being there in person to witness the insanity of extreme activists. That was my initiation. We were 
a, a, we were a group of about maybe 50, surrounded by a mob of at least 300 LGBTQ activists. The police had said they would keep these two groups apart, but they did nothing when the activists elbowed their way into our group, yelling in our faces with blow horns and not letting us speak. I was so inspired to be there with the likes of Kara Dansky, Olympic cyclist Inga Thompson, and Save Women's Sports USA founder Bess Stelzer. But even while we relished the collaborations, it felt like we were drowning together. And of course, by June 2020, we had lost, and the Bostock decision went against our desire to have biological sex affirmed in the workplace. Here's how the ACLU put it. Quote, on June 15, 2020, we won. The court held that everyone in this, every state in the country who works or applies for a job with an employer that has at least 15 employees is protected under federal law against employment discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity, unquote. Now, let me be very clear. While none of us were there, or who were there, at the Supreme Court that day in 2019, none of us would have thought that people should be fired on the basis of gender identity. That's not what we were saying. Our concern was that it would send the, set the precedent for the future unraveling of Title IX being a law based on biological sex. And we were not wrong. The ACLU jumped to use the Bostock ruling multiple times. So they, uh, multiple times. So for example, chirping in, in about uh, 2022 in a report, quote, after Bostock, there is no question that adverse unequal treatment of transgender students, including barring them from using restrooms corresponding to their gender identity, discriminates on sex in violation of Title IX. And of course, it set the stage for President Joe Biden is his executive order signed on his first day in office using the term, using the reasoning of Bostock to assert that the word sex in Title IX would henceforth mean gender identity. Stage five, upward turn, 2020 to 2021. Then COVID hit. It was terrible. But it also heralded a light at the end of our long, dark tunnel. Meaning, it gave many of us in this struggle a time to connect with each other and online and strengthen our affiliations. I had only a small bubble of athletes to coach anymore, so I had some time. And then about a month after lockdown, um, Canadian journalist Barbara Kay called me out of the blue to recommend I write a book about what was happening in sports. So we did it. We wrote a book. This was our COVID project, and Rebel News published it in 2021. Unsporting, how trans activism and science denial are destroying sport. Much of what I am telling you today is explained in the book. It's, uh, you can find it on Amazon. There were a few for sale yesterday, and they're gone. Meanwhile, I continue to push back against the gender ideology making inroads into Canadian track and field. Back home in my own province as president of the Board of Athletics Alberta, at least I was able to ensure that eligibility rules were based upon biological sex. Our code of conduct and ethics included this stipulation. Athletes will have the responsibility to, one of them, properly represent themselves and not attempt to participate in a competition for which they are not eligible for reasons of age, biological sex, or other reason. And the appendix, which I'm not showing here, the appendix linked to this statement in our policy, or in our code of conduct, stated that if you were born male, you compete in the male category. Was there shunning and intimidation at the national meetings for this stance? Yes, there was. I was even told we were in violation of Canadian criminal law. I'm breaking the law. But I noticed that all it took was one voice, mine, at the table at national meetings to get other sports leaders to question and to reconsider things. And it showed me that we live in a time that requires leadership from below. Meaning that it's all of us on ground level. The elites, the elites, as James would say, are too frightened of, to lose positions and lose market share or whatever they want to, you know. They aren't going to do anything. It's us. It's at ground level. So working through, and I'll go to the next slide. Working through. Stage six. Then a megaton bomb went off. Leah Thomas in the NC2A women's swimming competitions. 
the singular, this singular epic failure by both the Ivy League and the NC2A to protect their female athletes and abide by Title IX brought the sports issue into the nation's living rooms. I was there that St. Patrick's Day 2022 to witness this moment for myself. Posey Parker, Kelly J. Keene, there was sitting at my right elbow just then, and you can actually hear her yell, cheat, so please play the video. <laughs> Don't you love Kelly J. Keen? Cheers. cheers. <laughs> that abomination brought new groups of women into the battle. Icons women and Riley Gaines. Um, so I can't remember where I'm at here. Yes, Riley Gaines. Um, they now have large platforms and have the ear of the political class. But nine months before that, Leah Thomas affair, there were the 2021 Olympic Games where Laurel Hubbard was allowed to compete in the women's Olympic weightlifting. The IOC was embarrassed, publicly embarrassed, into admitting that its 2015 policy on self-ID was not fit for purpose. Immediately after the Games, the chair of the IOC Medical Commission promised a new consultation on eligibility in the women's category. Even though women from around the world asked that this time, women could have a seat at the table to share our perspectives on safeguarding of the women's category, we found that once again the IOC had invited only the trans activists to the meetings and consultations in Switzerland. And of course, the resulting 2021 IOC policy upgrade, upgrade was worse than the one that had allowed Hubbard to compete. Now it was like, if you ran in a race with a guy, now it's up to the girls to prove that there's some sort of overwhelming uh, advantage. So it's even worse. Anyway, the disregard for women was finally so blatant that the women's sex-based sports advocacy groups around the world had reached our limit. We realized that to have the female voice in the room where it happens, quoting Hamilton, would require collaboration on a scale that had not happened since the 1920s. You know, there used to be at Women's Olympics back in the 1920s. But that group was absorbed into the Olympic movement in 1928. In January of this very year, 2023, women's sports groups from 10 countries came together to form the International Consortium on Female Sports, ICFS. This is now a strong international sports lobby group that has the backing of the sex-based rights WDI, Women's Declaration International, with 37, um, thousand signatories, 160 countries, and 517 organizations. Stage seven, effective activism. In the grieving process, stage seven is typically called acceptance and hope stage. But I'm calling it effective activism because this is the, the mechanism from which we support women, we sports women are deriving our hope. I don't have time to go into all the details about what Riley has done and Icons Women, like it's been amazing. And I don't have time to say how this wonderful woman in Canada's athlete, April Hutchinson, has finally speaking, been speaking out on programs like Tucker Carlson and there's just been so much going on. What I want to report today, just as is sort of my last story, is um, something that I was able to do. So starting in 2022, I dove deep into the trenches of grassroots politics in Canada. And you know, I couldn't possibly think about working with Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party, so I had to go d in deep into the Conservative Party of Canada, knowing there would be a policy convention in, in September of this year, 2023, two months ago. Through the, the nine months of twists and turns and 50-word limit, my fellow committee members succeeded in getting this policy resolution onto the plenary floor at the Canadian Conservative Party of Canada Convention in Quebec City on September 9, 2023. And this is what the policy reads. The Conservative Party of Canada believes that women are entitled to the safety, dignity, and privacy of single-sex spaces, for example, prisons, shelters, locker rooms, and washrooms, and the benefits of women-only categories, sports, awards, grants, and scholarships. For clarity, the term woman used throughout this CPC policy declaration means female person. Mm. 
Now I'm going to play one more video for you, and this is the convention floor, and I want you to listen. Like when you think we, we don't have people on our side, I want you to listen to the cheers of the 2,500 delegates to each of the side in this, in this video. My name is Linda Blade. I'm a sport performance coach from Edmonton, Strathcona. Women in Canada need our help. Single-sex, female-only spaces are disappearing in this country. It is not safe. It's not fair. Please let the CPC party be the one that stands for women and girls. It is not anti-anything. It's pro-women. Please vote yes. Thank you. Listen. Next speaker, please, at the no microphone. My name is Andrea from Montreal. I feel we'll very safe, honestly. This country is great, but let me tell you, the Liberals would love nothing more than to throw this, this, this issue onto the table and say we are dividing the country. Please, let's get them out. Let's get Polyev in. Let's not leave ourselves divided. Let's join and get ourselves elected, please. Please at the yes microphone. Almost there. Um, Madison Harvey, Sherrod Park. We as women cross the street to get away from groups of men. We avoid going out at night to stay safe. I am 15 and more than once have I had to hide in restrooms with my nine-year-old sister and my 11-year-old sister to avoid men that have followed us around stores. And now we want to open up the doors and say after you, vote yes to protect your daughters, wives, and nieces. You can, you can hear that it's a huge thunder. If you were in the room, you'd hear it. And then here's the result. 87% yes. The resolution receives a majority of votes. So now, the is in territory as it has passed. The next government, if, if uh, the conservative government gets um, in, into power, the next election, that's sitting in the books. They're not bound to do anything about it, but it's in the books, so when it comes time, we can pressure them to follow up on the policy. And that's what you do have to do, step by step. And let me just finish by saying this. Sorry, I'm way over time. Um, a conservative government will protect... This was also passed by another writing in the, in the woke uh, province of British Columbia. I have to say this in this meeting. A conservative government will protect children by prohibiting life-altering medicine or surgical interventions on minors under 18 to treat gender confusion or dysphoria and encourage positive mental and physical health support for all Canadians suffering from gender dysphoria and related health challenges. That passed by 69%. So there's a promise in the future.